You're listening to a podcast from 702. 702. The Naked Scientist. Ah, oh, yes, I love doing this show on a Monday when I do get a chance because, yes, I do get to speak to the Naked Scientist. That's uh, Dr. Chris Smith, and he fascinates me always. And if you have your questions, and I'm sure something's been worrying you, something's boggles your mind, you can call him 011 883 0702 or WhatsApp us your voice note or your question 072 702 1702. And Chris, uh, good afternoon, and hi there. Lovely to speak to you again. Yeah, well, likewise, likewise. My favourite time of the week, too. Well, we were talking the, the, in the half hour before you, we were talking about friendships and, you know, teaching our children about friendships and how involved we should be as parents. And it got me thinking about what attracts us to the friends that we have. Well, there, there must be something, you know, when they say sort of wolves travel in packs and people, dogs travel in packs. Are there certain things, are there certain chemical reactions that make us want to be friends with certain people? Yeah, good question. There must be. But I don't know immediately what they would be. I don't think anyone does know what that, that missing link or that secret formula is because if they did, then they'd make, make a million doing it, wouldn't they? Because they would just peddle, here's your perfect match made in heaven. I think it's a range of things. Mm. And people who have got good at looking at sort of matchmaking apps and that kind of thing will tell you that it's not just one thing. There's when it's boy meets girl, there's certainly a visual side to it. There's that sort of attraction. But then it's friend meets friend. You're not so interested in what the other person looks like. You're interested to a certain extent because people do tend to pick people that share certain features with them. And that might be that they look a certain way, dress a certain way and flamboyant in the same sort of way mm. so i think we're weighing up a whole raft of things when we make friends with people and, and i'm not talking about playmates when you're at nursery because i don't think they're the same sort of friend the friendships that develop as you get a little bit older and a little bit more socially informed and the front part of your brain develops more i think they are informed by a whole raft of different things which will range from what someone looks like the kinds of things they say mm. the kinds of things they're interested in the kinds of things they wear and we integrate all of this together because remember we like doing things with other people we've evolved to be a social species and to to have safety in numbers to have success in numbers so we're looking for people that are on our wavelength that we can communicate with mm. so that we can do things in a successful way together so I, I don't think you can pin it on one single thing i think it's going to be a whole raft of things with the healthy helping of the social factors yeah. heaped on top by yeah. the environment we grow up in and personalities okay well i was just wondering about that one we've got uh, Poloso in centurion who has a question for you uh Poloso, what uh, Poloso, what what is it you want to ask chris uh, hello uh, i wanted to ask uh, uh, dr chris in terms of the most uh, addiction to light what uh, scientific advancements will be able to help the most uh, from flame Oh, why is a moth attracted to a flame? Mm. Well, we think that some of these flying insects, they have really quite good vision and they navigate by using the position of the sun. So an, a bee, for example, tells the other animals, the other bees in the hive, where the food is by doing an intricate mm. so-called waggle dance inside the hive. And they will tell the other bees where in relation to a compass direction and how far to fly to find a source of food. They are using as their compass the sun and so they are orienting themselves with respect to the sun and flying at a certain angle to the sun and they adjust that they can even take into account the effect of time they have a body clock in their brain ticking away and they adjust the angle they adopt relative to the sun to fly in the right direction monarch butterflies that migrate thousands of kilometers in northern um, america do the same thing. They set their internal compass and adjust it according to where the sun is in the sky. And they can even see in the ultraviolet range. So even when it's a cloudy day and you can't see the sun, they can because the UV rays come straight through and they can still see them. So moths, many other insects that have the same sorts of eyes, use bright lights as a navigation cue. Mm. When we come along with a light bulb and we therefore make a, a massive sun or moon very, very close to where the insect is, it is so used to flying and relative to it, the 
direction or angle that it's flying relative to that source of light is is it's because it's so far away it, it it barely changes when they fly along but when you've got a light bulb and the animal's very close to it it flies a short distance and now the angle relative to the thing is is hugely different so of course it adjusts its position it adjusts its position and that's where you end up with your moth going in, in a circle around the light uh, i don't think genetics is going to fix that it's just the fact that in the modern era here we are encroaching on nature with modern technology that nature has not evolved to accommodate so animals that use basic methods of, of navigation that have been there for millions of years and they've evolved to work that way they are fooled by modern inventions and we have to be cautious about this because when we come along with sounds and light and we change an environment in that way we really do upset the apple cart for mm. many of these animals and they do a very important job for us moths do enormous amount of pollination people don't realize they think when you say who pollinates the food that makes makes the food that you eat flourish and people say bees actually mm. yeah they do a good job but other animals like moths mm. especially nocturnally active ones are doing a really important job behind the scenes and we don't see them so we've got to look after these guys and Chris, I think Poloso more specifically wanted to know what scientific advancement will end a moth's attraction. Will there be some kind of uh, evolution or something right. that will eventually, you know, stop this self-destruction? <laughs> well, I think really us being more concerned about how our influences and our, our, our behaviours affect the natural world, that has got to be part and parcel of it. Prevention is always better than cure. But eventually you will see that animals that tend to be more robust and more resilient against this kind of thing are going to be the ones that do tend to survive we will unfortunately see victims if you change the environment there will be animals that can't adapt there will be species mm. that just can't accommodate and they will be lost they will be replaced by animals that are not so susceptible to those sorts of influences all right uh, terence in springs you have a question hi there hi you hi doc um hi. yeah this was a question actually put to me by my son so he asked me that when you're on the Earth's surface, you obviously feel the heat of the sun, especially in the summer months, right? But as you go higher out of the Earth's atmosphere, it actually gets colder. And shouldn't it be getting warmer because you're getting closer to the sun? Mm. So I don't know how to answer him on that one. So why does it get yeah, colder good, when good you're close to the sun? Mm. Right. Well, first of all, why is it warm on the Earth's surface? And the reason is that it's nothing to do with being closer to the sun, because the sun is millions of kilometers away, and the distance sure. between you being on the Earth's surface or 100 kilometers up in the air, which is where space officially starts, that's so trivial in and inconsequential in the scheme of things compared to the millions plus kilometers that you've got to go to get to the sun, it's no difference whatsoever. It's warm close to the ground surface because each square meter of the ground surface is being hit by sunlight at the rate of about one kilowatt. So it's like you having a one bar electric fire on every single square kilometer of the Earth's surface when the sun's shining. The Earth's wow. surface absorbs the light and it converts it from photons that you can see, visual light energy, into heat, infrared, which it then radiates back up off the surface skyward and because you're standing there you get hit by some of that so it feels warm and the air around you is seeing some of that not much because it's mainly transparent to it but it'll absorb some and that will also make the air around you feel warm so you feel warm as you go up in the atmosphere the pressure drops so gas expands as it goes higher that's why things float up but as it expands it also cools because in the same way when you've got a gas expanding it's a bit like spraying a deodorant in your armpit it mm. feels cold because the gas is doing work against atmospheric pressure it's expanding and if you do work you use energy and so the temperature drops so on the way up in the atmosphere there is a drop in temperature but what's really weird and catches some people out and we saw this ourselves we sent a balloon into space or almost into space a few years ago as an experiment on the naked scientists and we got it to almost the same height that elon musk's rocket got to last week before it went pop and our balloon went pop but ours was programmed to go pop we were recording the temperature on the way up and all the way up until about 15 to 20 kilometers up it got colder and colder and colder till it was almost minus 100 at one point and then suddenly the temperature went flying up again and the significance of 15 to 20 degree um, kilometers is that's where the ozone layer is mm. so what you've got around the earth's atmosphere is is a shield of ozone which is fending off a lot of the most powerful very high energy radiation coming from the sun so as you go upwards in the atmosphere yes it gets colder yes it keeps getting colder until you get beyond the ozone layer 
and then the cooling effect of the expanding atmosphere is offset by the fact you're then bom bombarded by really powerful hot radiation from the sun again and then the temperature starts to climb and beyond about 20 plus kilometers up we were recording temperatures that were almost as warm on the earth's surface again because our our instruments were being hit by all this intense sunlight that wasn't being shielded by the atmosphere and screened out by the ozone layer. Mm. So it's a couple of factors, just in summary. As you go up in the air, the air expands. When you expand a gas, it cools, so there is a cooling effect. There's also a loss of energy because of the ozone layer that stops that coming back in. Once you go beyond that, though, you start being hit by intense radiation from the sun, which can drive the temperature back up again. And that's why astronauts have to wear special spacesuits that don't just keep them warm, they also keep them cool mm. under certain circumstances. Well, thanks for that summary, Chris, because I was worried how Terence was going to remember all of this to tell his son. <laughs> well, Terence, I hope you have all of that, and it does make perfect, Thank perfect you. sense. All right, well, good luck with that one and explaining that one, but it does make sense now. Cindy in River Club, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Rebecca and Dr. Chris. Um, I guess the kids have all the questions today. Mine is from my <laughs> six-year-old. Mm, go ahead. Um, she, we were watching a show. Um, it's called Emergency NYC, and uh, these neurosurgeons were performing brain surgery and wearing glasses that had two, two different colored lenses. So one lens was kind of a dark purple or a dark blue, and the other one was a clear lens. And the question we have is, what function do those lenses serve? Ooh, I don't know. I haven't seen that. Um, so if anyone neurosurgically inclined is listening mm. and knows about this kit, can they phone us up and let us know? I can speculate that it could have been just that they had one lens set up in order to make something magnified. Because when you're doing very intricate work, sometimes you want to see and magnify the area, but you don't want both eyes looking at that mm. because you could end up with a, a difficulty in actually orientating yourself. Sometimes there are some also some clever kit you can you can now use that superimposes maps of things over bits of the body surface and it can do it with a color that you can screen out with a lens so that you only mm -hmm. see it when it's going through that eye. So you, you could be, could be doing that as well, but I haven't seen the footage and I haven't seen that particular gadget. So if someone could help me out, I'd be very grateful and tell us why a neurosurgeon would be wearing a, a tinted lens mm. on one eye only. All right. Well, Chris is going to have to watch, uh, what is it? Em Emergency NYC then Emergency on Netflix. NYC. All right, Chris, there's homework yeah. for you. Uh, <laughs> All right, Cindy. <laughs> Thank you. And if you have a question for Chris, the Naked Scientist, 011-883-0702, or send us your voice note or your question to 072-702-1702. Chris, uh, a couple of uh, messages coming through. Uh, hi there. Please ask, uh, Chris, what makes the muscles grow faster when you gym besides using supplements? Ooh, why do they get bigger? Well, inside a muscle are contractile filaments. They're proteins. These are called actin and myosin fibrils. They literally look like rods or little strings, and they interdigitate. It's a bit like you reaching out your right and left hand in front of you and slotting your fingers together. So you, you almost make a basket with your mm. hands. The fibrils of muscle do that. And the myosin, which is one of those flavors of fibril have motors on them that grab hold of the actin and winch the actin across the myosin which is how the muscle gets shorter whenever it does that and the more work you subject a muscle to the more stimulus there is to the muscle to get bigger so the more you work a muscle the more it grows and it does this for two reasons one is that the body is all about maintaining the right amount of muscle or tissue in fact right amount of anything to match the demands placed upon the body and that's where training comes in the more you train the more you adapt your body to be better at meeting the demands of that particular exercise or, or whatever it is you're doing mm. secondly whenever you use a muscle you damage it very slightly and so the stimulus the growth stimulus is a repair process and in the course of doing the repair you also make a bit more muscle in order to safeguard against future damage that's resilience. And so that's why training makes you bigger and stronger. 
because you are damaging yourself a tiny amount in an inconsequential way, triggering the repair response, which in, in, in itself reinforces what you've got to make it less likely you'll damage it next time. So in the same way that if you built a house, there was a really bad storm and your house got blown flat, next time you build a stronger house, and so on and so on, to make it more resilient. And that's how your body defends itself, but it doesn't waste anything because it doesn't overdo the amount of muscle and then have loads of muscle hanging around that you don't need to use mm. because muscle's very costly to run. Yeah, very, very costly. You've got to feed them all the time, like teenagers. So another one, Chris, um, can the doctor tell me what makes us human beings sweaty? Why do our hands sweat and why do we even fart when we're nervous? Hmm. <laughs> well, let's start with the sweat first yes, and then please. we'll move on to the other aspect <laughs> the of the question. part, yes. <laughs> it, it, correct. The point about sweating is thermal control. We are homeothermic as a species. In other words, we maintain the same temperature. We are warm-blooded, to put it into another parlance. And this means that we can be extremely effective in what we do because we can optimise our energy production and our muscle function to always work at full tilt because our body temperature is always just right. It's at just the optimum for all those processes, the ones that give us energy, the ones that break down rubbish, the ones that make us move, to work perfectly. And the way in which we maintain our body temperature is by having processes that can make heat when we haven't got enough of it, and have processes that lose heat when we've got too much of it. And one way we lose heat is we divert blood very close to the, the skin surface, and this is why your skin goes red when or redder when you are hot. You also activate sweating, and you have glands in your skin surface concentrated particularly in certain parts of the body, but they're, they're pretty much everywhere, and these ones take the liquid part of blood called plasma and they squirt that some of that liquid onto the skin surface as a film of water and water absorbs the heat which is on the skin surface and evaporates and as it does so it takes with it what's called the latent heat of evaporation it takes extra energy to turn a liquid into mm. a gas and once it's gone into a gas and left the body and it's in the air it's taken the energy that it took to do that away from your body and cooled you down now that's when you get too hot but we also have ways of sweating because it's under the control of our automatic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system. It can also sometimes be activated when you are frightened. And the rationale for that is if you're going to have to run away or fight and beat off somebody or disappear in, into the distance because someone's after you, you're probably going to get very hot doing that. So the body anticipates that heat production and it activates your sweating mechanism so that you are not going to overheat and therefore be run down by the person who's after you or the animal or whatever mm. you're running away from. So you sweat for that reason when you're fearful as well. And so that's why you get sweat, sweaty and hot when you're doing exercise, but sometimes when you're nervous about something, you will also find you get a bit clammy and mm. you're not too hot and you feel clammy because you've made sweat inappropriately. The farting one, well, that's just down to what's in your intestines, and those are bacteria. There are more bugs living in you and mm. on you than there are actually cells in your whole adult body. Right. And, in fact, if you added them all up, they'd weigh more than a kilo, just of bugs in, wow. in your intestines. Really? And they see your dinner before you do. <laughs> so as you begin to break down your dinner, there will be things that you don't have the metabolic biochemical know-how to dismantle. But those microbes do, and there are some sugars and some carbohydrates, for example, and roughage that they're really good at breaking apart. And when they break them up, one of the things they release as they metabolize those things are things like carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and under certain circumstances, if you've also eaten some sulfur-containing things, hydrogen sulfide and a bit of methane. And so, yes, it is possible to set fire to your farts. <laughs> and some foodstuffs <laughs> will upset the apple cart metabolically and they will make more gas than others, especially in some people who are switching diets. For instance, yeah. if you normally don't eat many vegetables and suddenly you eat loads, you will yeah. produce a lot more bowel gas and that will make you a lot more farty. And even when you're nervous, so the metabolism's up, so this just ignites everything. Is that what happens? Well, it could do. When you're yeah. nervous, you could, you could also, A, switch your diet. B, you're going to secrete different amounts of stomach acid and pancreatic juice, so you will adjust the way your um, biochemical environment is running in your intestines, and that will in turn have a knock-on effect on the microbes wow. that are there, which will in turn have a knock-on effect on how you digest your food okay. and how they digest your food. It could be a defense mechanism. Whatever's making you nervous, it would be knocked out when, once you've let rip. <laughs> Dr. Chris Smith, thank you very much for your time. Fascinating as always, quite an enjoyable uh, discussion, and thanks for your questions as well.